Thank you everybody for being here tonight. We really appreciate all your support and attendance at our History Revealed programs. And as always, I wanna thank the Eastside Freedom Library for being here, as well as our other supporter, the Roseville Library. Um, please consider supporting the Ramsey County History Society and the Eastside Freedom Library. We rely on our members and friends like you to keep presenting these programs. And there are lots of benefits to joining. So you can see those on our website, www.rchs.com and the Eastside Freedom Library's website, which Clarence will put a link in the chat in a little bit. And um, if you have any questions, feel free to um, put something in the chat to me and I'll be happy to answer those. We are committed uh, to presenting the stories and histories of all in our community. And we're so pleased to bring you tonight's program with Dr. Katarzyna Litak on the Interrupted Childhood, the Histories of Polish World War II Survivors in Minnesota, which is a conjunction mm -hmm. with an exhibition that she will talk about. So before we get into the program, I just want to remind everybody, if you could keep your microphones and cameras turned off during the formal presentation, you can put questions and comments in the chat. Mm -hmm. And after the program, we'll be happy to turn your microphones and cameras back mm -hmm. on if you have something you'd like to share. Um, the Ramsey County Historical Society has a statement that acknowledges the sacred Dakota land. Minnesota Mekoche, the land where the waters are so clear they reflect the clouds, is the ancestral and contemporary homeland of the Dakota people. It is also home to the Anishinaabe and other indigenous peoples. The Ramsey County Historical Society acknowledges that its sites are located on and benefit from these sacred Dakota lands. RCHS is committed to preserving the past, informing our present, and inspiring our future. Part of doing so is acknowledging the painful history and current challenges facing the Dakota people just as we celebrate the contributions of Dakota and other Indigenous peoples. And you can find our full land acknowledgement statement on our website, which is rchs.com, which includes actionable ways in which RCHS pledges to honor the Dakota and other Indigenous peoples of Minnesota, Makoche. Um, I want to do a little shout out to our other partner, Subtext Books. Um, you can find other history revealed titles and other books of interest at HTTPS subtextbooks.com. And um, Clarence, I'm going to turn it over to Clarence from the Eastside Freedom Library in just a minute. But please watch our websites for upcoming programs. We will be rescheduling the May program and filling in some of those gaps in May and later in the summer. So we are always adding new programs. So again, thank you all for being here. And thank you to Katarzyna Litak for this wonderful presentation. So I'm going to turn it over to Clarence White from the Eastside Freedom Library. Thank you, Robin. Uh, I'm Clarence White. I'm the Associate Director at the Eastside Freedom Library. Uh, I want to thank everyone for joining us tonight. Um, I also want to thank the Ramsey County Historical Society and uh, the Ramsey County Libraries uh, for this partnership. Um, Katarzyna, we're thankful that you brought so many of these uh, programs and this story to us. I have the privilege of working with a lot of historians, um, many of whom uh, are very disappointed in the way that history is taught in our schools and how it is consumed generally. And I think this is a great way to enter into the stories and some of the scholarship that makes this real and important. So thank you again. Um, as as uh, uh, Robin said, uh, our schedules are available on our website. I will put ours in the chat. Uh, we have a couple of events coming up soon on the 11th. Tuesday the 11th, we'll have an event with the University of California graduate employees. We're talking about how they organize and formed a union. Um, and the next day, we have a movie screening in the library. It's called Push. It's a, a, a story on gentrification and uh, is presented by our housing justice program. Um, so we would love it if you would join us for that or any of the other programs that we, the Ramsey County Historical Society and Ramsey County Library do. So with that, I will pass it off to Katarzyna and uh, thanks again for everyone joining us. Thank you. Let me uh, share my screen. 
All right. Uh, thank you very much for a wonderful introduction. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Uh, yes, we thank, can see it. Thank you. Um, so um, I'm presenting uh, Kaleidoscope Polski Minnesota, uh, which uh, most of the English speakers can understand. Uh, this is a project that connects visual arts uh, with narratives. Uh, after months of research and preparation, we set up an oral history uh, project combined with visual documentary about Polish uh, Americans in the state of Minnesota. We uh, found out that this is a story that has been missing from uh, public discourse in Minnesota. If you're curious about the picture, the picture is a reflection picture. It's a, a, it's a, a rock in a, in, a, in a lake, and it, um, it depicts the lives of immigrants, which are literally upside down. So this is, in a way, an upside down picture that is supposed to depict the lives of uh, immigrants. So if people would can't really see me uh, in a person, this is my picture. Uh, I'm originally from Wrocław, Poland. I am a first Polish, first generation Polish American and I've been living in Minnesota since mid 1990s. I'm currently the president of Minnesota Polish Medical Society. In, uh, 19, in 2020, in the spring, we contracted a documentary photography uh, professor from uh, for Poland uh to do the visual part of the project i took the roles of the designer of the project project manager subject interviewer and i am the curator of the exhibits so the exhibit i would like to recognize our sponsors um, i am very grateful for the partnership of the ramsey county historical society the east side freedom library and uh, roseville library um, also, that there have been contributions to our projects from the Schubert Club, the Kowalski's Market, and that our work has been uh, received grants from Minnesota Historical Society, Minnesota State's Art Board, Metro Regional Arts Council. So in the project, we would like to present contemporary uh, Polish Americans beyond uh, well-known stereotypes. Uh, Polish people in America are mostly known for pierogi, uh, but Polish and Polish American life and culture are much more diverse than this. Uh, we do hope that this project will present Polish Americans in Minnesota uh, outside of folk festivals and folk customs as involved in daily activities along with other Americans. We also hope to present uh, to the world that there are Polish Americans uh, living in Minnesota. Um, typically, uh, when you think about uh, Polish Americans outside of uh, the United States, people connect Chicago or New York as typical centers uh, of Polish Americans, but actually Polish Americans live across the country. Um, the project has been conducted in smaller groups. When, I, when we started designing the project, uh, the initial intent was to have a one large project depicting uh, just a small representation of a variety of groups. We divided the groups in five, uh, five different groups, but we re realized that each of the groups was so diverse that they, uh, that they needed their own uh, uh, phase of the project. We completed two phases of the project. We have documented uh, uh, and captured the narratives of Polish uh, Americans who immigrated to the United States as refugees following the Second World War, which is the, the main focus of this presentation. We completed also the phase two of the project, which uh, recorded uh, Polish Americans who came to Minnesota in 1980s as political refugees. They were involved in solidarity uh, freedom movement in Poland in 1980s. Some people may be familiar with that movement. Uh, we are preparing to start phase three, uh, and those this phase three will focus on uh, recording narratives and, and uh, uh, pictures of uh, people who came from behind the Iron Curtain. We, uh, we uh, the, and the other two phases are going to be people like um, who came in the in the 80s after the Iron Curtain fell fell down in 1989, and. Uh, and we will uh, focus also on uh, second and third generation Polish Americans. 
uh, we will consider this project to be a success if Polish Americans feel included in Minnesota history of immigration. Um, then we also hope that observers of our exhibits and, and uh, the people who hear the histories will experience powerful sense of empathy in witnessing these stories through a positive and compassionate lens. What drives this project is a thoughtful and reflective desire to share how Poles are overcoming such obstacles in a way that may prove inspiration to others. The question is, why did we choose photography? Uh, uh, as Dorothea Lang said, a camera is a tool for teaching how to see without camera. And uh, we chose, as uh, uh, Mr. White referred, history is as a difficult subject to, uh, to teach and uh, is uh, there has not been as much of a focus uh, of, of teaching people history, especially history of, uh, of Europe. So when people think about history of Europe, they tend to focus on uh, uh, Great Britain, France, uh, or Germany and other countries, and especially Central and Eastern Europe uh, remains in a shadow. People actually don't know much about that part of the history, which as we are seeing with the current events, maybe uh, uh, maybe an obstacle to understanding what's actually going on in that part of the world and it's affecting us all at this time. So uh, the history of talk, to history, uh, talking about large numbers and troop movements tend to be very dried and abstract. We wanted to focus on individual stories to connecting uh, smaller stories to larger historical events. Uh, the power of documentary photography lies in the sum of degree of iconization. The individuals are uh, to illustrate the problem at a greater level than the, their own story, and they are representatives of the story. Through the, during the project, uh, we are attempting to connect historical facts and events with narratives to document how the large historical events played on the human scale in attempt to describe the frame of reference. Uh, we collected uh, small and unique stories that only make sense when connected to a larger narrative. Through the, uh, we attempted to verify the individual stories as much as possible. We reached out to archives both in Poland and in the United States. Um, and uh, we have been, uh, we have been uh, showing our work uh, since uh, December of 2021. We've had exhibits at the Landmark Center. Uh, we have it currently on display at the Landmark, uh, Landmark Center. I would like to invite you to it. Uh, it's going to be on display until April uh, 30th. We had uh, exhibits at St. Thomas University and we had exhibits at the ca state capitol twice. Um, and the goal of the exhibits is to uh, bring the life, the complicated layers of meaning in communal and personal narratives, and to use documentary photography to share individual narratives with the broader, broader community. We would like to go beyond the uh, historical, conventional historical sources to uncover the largely hidden history of this group, which has been uh, missing from the mainstream accounts. Uh, as we were collecting the stories, we uh, realized uh, what's really apparent is that individual narratives help people to make sense of their personal experience uh, for themselves and within the larger context. Uh, we do would like to acknowledge that humanity and people have always faced adversity and uh, understanding and hearing about some of the challenges that the Polish people have experienced uh, uh, can help us understand and get through some of the challenges we are facing right now. Uh, the stories of the ways of others who survived wars and deprivation convey the idea that we have collective <coughs> strengths to overcome new challenges. And why is it important to talk about history? Uh, history is not about the parade of great men or motion of large scale forces. Human is, uh, sorry, history is a human process of social and political change that can only develop through individual actions and interactions. We all are making history. Without, uh, without uh, much ado, I'd like to move on to the, the, the history part. It's very difficult to understand the narratives and histories of the seven individuals we included in the project if people don't know much about po history of Poland. Uh, so Poland witnessed many invasions over the years. 
uh, army seized it for themselves or swept through on the way to another power. Uh, it's worth remembering that Poland did not exist as independent state uh, during the First World War. Um, and its geographical position between the, the fighting powers of First World War uh, meant that much of the fighting and terrific human and material losses occurred in the Polish lands between 1914 and 1918. This is a map of Poland. Um, because uh, The reason I'm showing this is because Poland, people don't realize that Poland moved uh, between the first, uh, after the first and uh, after the second world war. Uh, so this is the boundary of Poland um, uh, during the, before the second world war and uh, the pink uh, area is uh, current Poland's borders. So Poland moved westward quite a bit. Uh, it's it's interesting because when uh, people are trying to uh, investigate their ancestors' uh, stories and they find out that find the the place or the city or the village where the ancestors came came from and they are looking at the map and they are seeing that it's either Lithuania, Ukraine, or or Belarus now. Uh, people don't realize that uh, actually uh, that was part of Poland before the Second World War. There are some uh, families that changed nationality five times without moving. Like when you think about my family, my uh, my grandparents were Austrian. Uh, they were Polish, but they were Austrian subjects. Then they were Polish uh, between 1918 and 39. Then they were German, uh, German citizens, and then they were Polish and they didn't move. Uh, so in August of 1939, Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union signed a non-aggression treaty. A week later, Germany invaded Poland and the World War II began. The first attack took on September 1st. Uh, on September 3rd, France and United Kingdom declared war on Germany and bega began mobilizing their army and preparing uh, civilians. On September 17, the Soviet Union invaded Poland from the east. Uh, on September 28, the Soviets and Germans signed the Brest Agreement and established the common border, as you can see it here. Uh, and on October 10, Adolf Hitler, and Hitler announced that the war was victorious. And on October 30, Stalin announced the official annexation of Polish territories. Both German and Soviet occupations began with murder and brutality. Uh, many prisoners were executed on the spot or later during the war. Countless civilians were shot and imprisoned, including uh, political leaders, clergy, Boy Scouts, professors, teachers, government officials, doctors, professional arts, uh, professional and professional athletes. Um, Jews were signaled, uh, singled out for special brutality in the German sector. The, the brutal extermination of Jews proved uh, that people could be killed on unprecedented scale with impunity and with keeping in keeping with binding German law. All across Polish lands, uh, people were trying to survive. While the war lasted, uh, Germany needed labor. Uh, Na uh, Nazi Germany and the officials imposed labor obligations on able-bodied Poles as early as age 12, uh, the German authorities dictated where and how peoples were employed and could co and conscript, conscript, conscripted pe Polish people to perform labor in, right, right, in the Third Reich. Uh, Paul, uh, police grabbed Poles off the streets, trains from marketplaces and churches in the raids of villages, neighborhoods to fill the labor quotas. Uh, it is estimated, the estimates vary on the source, and please, uh, I am not a historian, so if I make a mistake on the number, just one and a half million of Polish citizens were deported to German territory for forced labor between 1939 and 45. Uh, by August 44, it is estimated that uh, Germany uh, used uh, up to almost 8 million of uh, foreign workers uh, in the territory of Greater German Reich. 
uh, there were strict decrees, uh, the, there were strict Polish decrees, uh, and uh, it, the, the decrees and the, the slave labor contributed to, to mass extermination of populations in occupied Europe. Uh, Poles have to, and other uh, slave laborers had to work seven days a week. They could not possess uh, objects of any values, including bikes and cameras or even lighters. Uh, Polish people were asked to wear letter P. You have a, uh, you have a letter this uh, depicted in this picture, um, and they had a special uh, uh, work permit. Uh, and many workers died as a result of these conditions, extreme maltreatment, severe malnutrition, and torture made, were the main uh, cause of death. And here goes Magdalena. She was born in Krakow in Poland on November 10th, 1925. During the World War II, she lived in Krakow until she was arrested. She was 16 uh, when she was arrested. She was arrested in a street roundup on the way from school uh, in 1941, only in her school clothes and her back backpack. She was sent to uh, Germany as a forced laborer. Uh, she, I, I have to admit that, you know, during this project, this project should have been uh, done uh, 10 years ago or even 20 years ago. Uh, people's memories were not the, the greatest. Uh, most of the individuals we interviewed were elderly people and some of them struggled with memory. Uh, she talked about being locked in a cart, being carted to some place in, uh, in Germany. She didn't even initially know where she was. People were, you know, she was a, just, a, just a student in, in school and people were asking her what she could do. And she said she could draw. She was an artist uh, at heart. She continued her art activities when she moved uh, to Minnesota after, uh, with her husband she met after in Germany after, um, uh, after the war ended. Uh, she talked about the atrocities being starved and hit and being terrified uh, a lot of the times. But she survived. She said that she survived because she was very lucky. Uh, and she commented that people were not as lucky as her. She said that in general, she was very lucky with the places where she was uh, with the employers and the places where she lived. And that's how she um, and how that's how she survived. Um, they moved to Minnesota in the 50s. They spent uh, about 10 years, uh, five years. Um, no, they spent about 10 years in various, living in various places in France um, because po people could not immigrate directly after the Second World War to the United States. Um, and they, uh, so they lived in France in multiple different uh, places be before they immigrated to the United States. So this is something that people are not quite aware of that people could not come to, uh, to the United States right away after the war ended. They, uh, they uh, were sponsored by the International Institute of Minnesota and Magdalena continued uh, giving Polish art classes uh, at, uh, through the International uh, uh, in Institute uh, of Minnesota. Moving on to the next narrative. The next person I'd like to talk about is uh, Walter. Um, so, Walter lived in a Soviet occupied uh, part of Poland, which and Soviets occupied more than 50% of Polish territory, which was inhabited by about 13 million people. The rest of the country was occupied by German, uh, the Germans. Uh, the people living in the Soviet occupation zone were declared Soviet citizens and men of military age conscripted, were conscripted into the Red Army. As soon as, uh, or even before the war started, the Soviets started working on classifying people uh, living in the occupied territory. And the categorization included age, ethnicity, religion, occupation, and home ownership. They said, as soon as they invaded, they started deporting people. And the first, the, the first people who were deported, were deported were the Polish soldiers who were involved in uh, uh, Second World War uh, September activities. Uh, it's worth noting that there was uh, there is an event described a uh, Katyn massacre uh, where uh, uh, the Soviet special forces murdered uh, a majority of Polish POWs. Uh, it's called Katyn massacre. 
The second group of Polish deportees were people who used to live in German occupied zone and fled to the Soviet zone. Many of those people who were deported were actually were Jewish. And the third category of, Pol, uh, of people who were deported were Poles who according to the Soviets were the work class enemies. And they again included teachers, police officers, people who were working for the government, even the railroad workers, physicians, dentists, uh, aristocrats, managers, um, owners of private companies. So Walter was one of those people deported, and he talked about being locked in uh, in a in a in a cart like this. This is actually a, a design that was uh, created in 1980, so it was used before the uh, the Soviets took over uh, the, uh, Russia, and uh, Russia Russia became Soviet Union. Uh, there could be up to 80 people crammed in this cart and the uh, and after a journey of many weeks people were placed in work camps uh, in so-called gulag system in siberia or dumped on steppe of kazakhstan with uh, no means of survival starvation was common and mortality rate was high about 30 percent of people uh, who were deported survived during the, a lot of people started dying as early as the second or third day of the transportation, and each train carried the corpses to the next town in a separate, separate open cart. The deportees who made the transports were used for cheap labor, and uh, they they worked in mines, building canals, railroads, logging, floating timber in taiga, worked in cohoses and factories. But um, on June 22nd uh, of 1941, Nazi Germany attacked Soviet Union and suddenly Soviet Union needed all the help they could get. So uh, great, in July of 1941, Great Britain and Soviet Union agreed to uh, co cooperate against uh, the fight of Nazi Germany. There was a, a London, Polish gover government in exile and the Soviet Union uh, came to the agreement that Soviets would release uh, the POWs and uh, Polish citizens who were in, a, in the work camp system and they would form a Polish army to, uh, to help uh, um, uh, Soviet Union fight the Nazis. Uh, the Polish army was to be commanded by uh, General Anders. You can see him on, this, uh, on the forefront of this picture. But soon, uh, soon, uh, the relationships became uh, started to sour. But uh, before they soured, Poles began to be released from their imprisonment and they had to uh, trek across uh, Soviet Russia uh, to find the to find the, the army headquarters. People were often uh, malnourished, gaunt, uh, they were barefoot oftentimes, uh, and they were wearing rags. What this was was uh, was Born in Burdykowszczyzna, Poland, which is now Belarus, uh, he was born in 1926 when his family was arrested and deported uh, following the Soviet army invasion of eastern Poland and the brutal occupation. Uh, they were sent to a Soviet work camp near Arkhangelsk, uh, Arctic Circle. After two years, uh, he they were released from the work camp and journeyed from uh, Arkhangelsk Arkhangelsk, it near the Arctic Circle to Uzbekistan, where the Polish are the first Polish army was uh, formed. As a teenager, uh, Walter was uh, was uh, when he was uh, his family was arrested. He had uh, uh, several siblings. He uh, was a teenager, uh, so when he actually made the family made it to the Polish army. Uh, he completed uh, military training for young soldiers in Egypt and participated in the legendary Monte Cassino battle in, in Italy in 1944. After uh, the war, he lived in Great Britain and immigrated to Minnesota in 1961. He talked about uh, living in if living in Siberia, uh, there was a family of seven and they would uh, receive only a loaf of bread for all of them for a week. They were very hungry. He talked about going to the nearby river and catching, trying to catch fish with his bare hands uh, or, uh, and, um, and trying to catch any, any animals in the forest they can and picking up berries because they were starving. One of his... Um, 
one of his young his youngest brother died uh, when they were uh, living in the Arctic Circle in Arkhangelsk, and uh, he said it until the the Polish army was uh, um, was formed, they 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 were for sure uh, certain that they were just going to die there, as many people did. As I mentioned before, the tension grew before uh, between the Polish leaders and the Soviets around a significant number of missing Polish POWs, which Poland found out much later after uh, much later that they were murdered, and then they accused there were accusations uh, uh, bouncing between the Germans uh, and the, the, the Nazi Germans and the Soviets blaming each other for these deaths. Uh, the Soviets, when the Soviets formed the first Polish army, they sought to shorten the training and wanted to incorporate the Polish units into their structures and their divisions, but, and they rejected the idea of Polish army. The, the general Anders felt that they are, the people were not prepared. They were sick and starving and malnourished. They were not uh, a, 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 a soldier material. So there was a decision made in, 19, in July of 1942 that uh, to move the first Polish army uh, from uh, the Soviet Union. Uh, and so that the, over 100,000 people journeyed from um, where, the, uh, where the, the Polish first Polish army was uh, formed to uh, Iran. And then the army journeyed through Iraq Egypt, uh, some of people stayed in uh, Lebanon. So there was a huge exodus of people. For many Poles arriving, uh, uh, there was a day, uh, their journey would end up in Iran, uh, but the, 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 the army journeyed on. So one of those, uh, one of the other people who were arrested, uh, living in the in the in the in the, in the, in the part that which was annexed by the Soviet Union in thirty nine, was Anatol Maciejny, who was born in uh, October 17, 1934. At the age of five, he was determined to be the enemy of the people, and he was deported with his mother and his sister by the security forces to a work camp in Siberia. What happened is when the family was uh, uh, supported, they were sitting on the, on the railroad tracks for a couple of days and his little sister who was uh, about a year old was dying. So they actually was separated. The sister was, le 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 was left behind. I will talk to her about her later. Um, and she left behind with an, uh, with an aunt, uh, but Anatol, age five, the enemy of the people, and his mother were deported to Siberia, uh, where his mother worked in a work camp. She was logging, uh, uh, logging. Uh, she was primarily working as a logger, and uh, she was not a. a, a, a um, I, I met her actually. She uh, she was a rather petite person. I I can't even imagine. Uh, so, so. Uh, Anatol was released with his mother from the work camp in the summer of uh, 41 and on the way to the Polish army under General Anders, uh, Anatol got separated from his mother uh, and he spent nine months in the Soviet Union uh, almost alone. On the brink of starvation, his mother found him in a Polish orphanage in Iran. So his mother uh, lost him in, in Soviet Russia and she found him in Iran. Uh, from there, uh, uh, Anatol and his mother journeyed to Iran and, and eventually to Lebanon, and they immigrated to the United States after the war. Anatol and his uh, family had a connection actually with Minnesota because their uh, grandfather uh, worked in, in, uh, in Minnesota. He came here as a, in, uh, in uh, 1800s and he worked actually in Anthony Main uh, uh, mills and uh, after he worked for for a little while he returned to Poland bought some land which then uh, uh, they were uh, marked as uh, big landowners which they were not but um, according to the uh, Soviet standards there were and that was the reason for their arrest because they were arrested as wealthy uh, uh, home uh, landowners and as Polish people uh, mother but the, by, the, by then was a widow. Uh, his father died um, uh, because he was a soldier. Uh, and so he died sometime in September of 1939. Um, 
So as the people were arriving uh, in Iran, um, the British authorities counted the, the, and registered the Polish arrivals. They set up schools, hospitals, and welfare centers. And Polish government contracted embassies and allied countries to see if they would give refuge to the Polish civilians, the over 100,000 people that journeyed from Soviet uh, uh, Russia to, uh, to Iran. And the following governments offered assistance, British uh, East Africa, Maharaja of Navan Janar in India, Jewish Agency in Palestine, Government of Mexico, uh, Prime Minister of New Zealand, and some people went to uh, East Africa as well. Uh, camps were established in R R Northern and Southern Rhodesia uh, the, and the Dominion of South, South Africa. The move to the site is a warmer climate uh, from uh, the Arctic Circle didn't really improve things much because people were dying from the malnutrition, typhus and typhoid fever and other diseases such as uh, uh, malaria. So uh, this is Anatol's picture from uh, Lebanon, actually. He spent quite a few years uh, in Lebanon. Uh, so overall, the Anders Army evacuated about 40,000, over 40,000 uh, 40, of uh, the soldier and about uh, 70,000 of civilians, including about, uh, I'm sorry, 40, 45,000 of uh, military uh, members and about 25,000 of, of uh, civilians and about 12,000 were children and many of them were orphans. This is another person that uh, lived in an eastern part of Poland, Leonar Jankowski was born in Vilno, which was Poland, and now it's Lithuania. He was born in on February 1st of 1936. Uh, Leonard's uh, story is unusual in the fact that his family avoided their arrest and deportation by uh, uh, the Soviet forces by escaping from the po part of Poland occupied by the Soviets to the part occupied by the Germans. Uh, he, uh, Leonard was talking about how his, uh, his uh, mother found out that they were to be arrested, but they escaped uh, at the last minute. And uh, he said that uh, um, they actually the German invasion uh, of, uh, of the Soviet Union saved them because they were slated for arrest um, soon, uh, you know, a few days later. At the end of the Second World War, Leonard lived in a, world, uh, in a refugee camp in Western Germany for five years before immigrating to the United States. He eventually became a Navy pilot and worked for uh, Northwest Airlines. Uh, his family also had a Minnesota connection before the war. His mother, uh, his family was Baptist and his mother uh, came uh, to Chicago uh, before the Second World War and she spent a few years in the Moody Bible Institute and she made connections and she traveled and uh, spend a few months in Minnesota. So when they uh, could immigrate to the United States, the family wrote a letter to uh, other Baptists in, in Minnesota, I think, uh, and then uh, they were sponsored by, by, the, by the Baptist, um, Baptist, fellow Baptists and uh, came to Minnesota because of their connection that his mother made before the Second World War through her studies in the United States. So this is Maria, uh, and uh, she is the sister of Anatol the, 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 uh, I, I talked about. So they were arrested together, uh, but Maria was separated from uh, her mother and her brother. What... Uh, what happened is like once, uh, so and, and Maria lived with an aunt. Uh, she actually lived with her aunt until she was 18 years old. Uh, what happened in 1943 when the Germans uh, announced that they have found the bodies of thousands of Polish officers in a mass grave in the Cotton Forest, uh, the Polish uh, government in exile asked uh, the Red Cross to investigate. Uh, Stalin and Soviet Union broke the diplomatic relations and uh, Pol uh, Polish government in, in relations with Polish uh, government in exile, ended the amnesty for Polish citizens and slammed the frontier posts. Uh, so Maria was stuck in the Soviet Union. She, as I said, 
she uh, before uh, she and her brother were born in Tutkov, which is in now in Ukraine. It was Poland. She was born on January 13th, 1939. Uh, she was separated uh, and stayed behind with her aunt. Uh, Tutkov is located in Volhynia, uh, which became a part of Soviet Soviet Union. Uh, she uh, after um, uh, after uh, the the end of the war. Uh, Maria was um, Volhynia, and the, the village where Maria grew up became the part of Soviet Union. And Maria was forcibly deported to Poland. So Maria grew up behind the Iron Curtain, and she could not reunite with her mother and her brother in in the United States until March of fifty seven, when she was eighteen years old. But what, when Maria was a child, uh, she survived so called Volhynia massacre. Between 30, 1943 to 45 members of Ukrainian insurgent army massacres, thousands of Poles throughout Bohemia. The numbers of casualties vary depending on the source from 20,000 to as high as 100 or 200,000. Ukrainians ruthlessly slaughtered Polish civilians and destroyed their home. Villages were burned to the ground and property was looted. Uh, the main, most of the victims were actually women and children, um, and many of the Polish victims were killed and tortured. Poles had to abandon their homes and sh seek shelters in cities and towns, uh, which uh, with uh, more uh, diverse populations, which actually had some posts of Hungarian and German troops. And it was an irony that in order to escape the, uh, the insurgent army, Poles had to seek protection from their oppressors, uh, oppressors first the Germans and then the Soviets. Uh, since the Soviet Union incorporated the region into its territory, uh, it, it was until 1991 that the communist censorship suppressed the public discourse surrounding the Winya massacre. I mentioned Holocaust. Uh, so Holocaust in Poland was part of European wide Holocaust organized by Germany, German, Nazi Germany and took place in German occupied Poland. Holocaust in Poland was marked by the construction of death camps and gas vans and mass shootings um, by uh, German troops and their auxiliaries. Um, the extermination camps played a central role in extermination of Polish and, Jew and Polish Jews and Jews from Germany transported to their deaths from the Western and Southern Europe. Every branch of the sophisticated German bureaucracy was involved in the killing process from the in interior and finance ministers to German first and sta state run railroads. Um, there was a in po Poland has special had special treatment. There was an or, uh, ordinance by a Nazi German governor Hans Frank, who uh, the ordinance provided that the death penalty for every Pole who would provide shelter for a Jew or help him in any way. And there was a principle of collective uh, responsibility applied to Germans. Uh, Germans not only uh, used the. Uh, the camps, uh, but also they just shot people, uh, you know, they first started executing unproductive elements so that people who were incapable to work, uh, but, you know, people uh, from the ghettos were not only transported to death camps, but they were also killed on a spot that is indigenous outside cities on the edge of the forests. Uh, here's Adam. Um, and Adam presents uh, in this photo, he presents uh, a medal of righteous among the nations. Uh, he, um, he, uh, he obtained certificates for his saviors. Uh, he, uh, during the genocide, about 3 million Jews were murdered. Half of all Jews were murdered during the Holocaust. And uh, Approximately 98% of the Jewish populations of Nazi-occupied Poland during the Holocaust were killed. A Jewish person had about one and a half percent of survival. About over 300,000 300, Polish Jews survived the war only. Adam was born in a Jewish family in Lvov, but his family was actually from Krakow. And when the war broke out, his uh, parents fled uh, eastward as 
did many polls, uh, not expecting Soviet Union to uh, attack from the east. Uh, Adam uh, survived ghettos in Yavorov. That's where he lived uh, with, that's where his parents ran away from Krakow to, uh, they ran away to uh, live with uh, Adam's paternal grandparents. So as there was a ghetto formed in the Avorów, yeah, Adam was uh, snuck by his na Polish nanny, Katarzyna, and into the um, ghetto in, uh, in Krakow, where he lived with his uh, maternal grandmother. Uh, when the ghetto was being um, liquidated in, in, um, in uh, Krakow, uh, somehow his nanny uh, got, got him out. And uh, he he spent uh, he spent uh, many years living with her until age five when he was reunited with his parents who miraculously survived Holocaust each of them separately actually his large family uh, only few members survived after the war the family was re relocated from Lvov which became the part of Soviet Union to Upper Silesia. Adam later lived in Israel, Germany, Austria, and the United States. He became a virtuoso violinist, a concertmaster who performed with many orchestras around the world, including Minnesota Orchestra. Those who were able to attend our opening on March 5th at the Landmark Center had an occasion of hearing Adam play. Um, he, was, uh, he gave a one hour concert at the age of uh, 80, 83, uh, which was really wonderful. It's very unusual. He's full, as you can see, he's full of energy. Here is another person. Uh, here's Victor. Victor was born in Warsaw in 38. Um, after the Germans and the Soviets jointly invaded Poland, uh, Victor's family moved out of Warsaw because Vic Victor's father was threatened with arrest by the Nazis. His father and, and both of his parents were, uh, were artists. His father was a theater director and they were threatened with an arrest. So they, they uh, spent the majority of the war in, in a little village in, a, in, a, in Eastern Poland, um, where his father was involved in, in, in an underground Polish home army. Uh, there, there, during the Second World War, there was um, very many Polish armies. It's, it's a, it could be a topic of a, of a lecture in itself. Um, after the family, uh, after the war, uh, the family returned to Warsaw. Uh, Victor became television, uh, docu television documentary filmmaker. In 1980, he became involved with the Solidarity Freedom Movement. Uh, and after the martial law was imposed, he worked for, uh, for one of the American uh, news, uh, news agencies. Uh, he was threatened with arrest, and uh, he was recognized as extremist act, extreme activist of solidarity and fled Poland. He lost his job, and uh, he had to leave Poland with a one-way passport. He lived in Minnesota with his family since 1983. What people don't realize is that um, Poland was greatly destroyed uh, during the, uh, the, the, the Second World War and the destruction of Poland and big Polish cities, particularly Warsaw was, uh, Warsaw was targeted. It started with, uh, with uh, air raids by Luftwaffe in 1939. Uh, many civilians were killed in the first wave of Germans attacks. About 40% of the buildings in Warsaw were damaged or destroyed. Um, Uh, there were, while the war lasted, there were two uprisings in Warsaw. Some people are not aware of it. Uh, the, there was a Warsaw ghetto uprising in 1949, which was an act of Jewish resistance in Warsaw in, the, uh, in uh, German-occupied Poland during the Second World War um, to oppose Nazi Germany's final effort to transport the remaining ghetto population to death camps. Um, this was the largest single revolt by Jews during the Second World War. The Jews knew they couldn't win, but their, and that their survivor was un unlikely. But as Mark Edelman said, he was the only surviving uh, commander 
Uh, their inspiration to fight was not to allow the Germans alone to pick the time and place of their deaths. Mark Edelman became a medical doctor and friend of one of our project participants. Uh, there was a second uprising uh, in 1944 in the summer, which was led by Polish resistant home army. Uh, the uprising time was time to coincide with the retreat of the German forces from Poland ahead of, of Soviet advance, very much like uh, it happened in other uh, cities in, the, in, in Europe, so, uh, for instance, Paris. Um, but the approaching Red Army temporarily halted its operation, enabling the Germans to regroup and defeat Polish resistance and destroy the city in retaliation. Destroy, the city was so destroyed that Polish people after the Second World War thought that maybe uh, they should even move the, the capital to a different city because 85 or 90 percent of the buildings were destroyed. Um, you know, and to end my, my, my lecture is that by October in uh, 1944, the news from Warsaw and from Poland were bleak. The Polish um, Home Army, uh, which uh, Victor's father was its member, uh, was uh, forced to surrender by 19, uh, January 1945. The Soviet Army had overrun the whole Poland. Uh, at the Big Three Conference, which is the conference between uh, Soviet Union, United States, and the United Kingdom at Yalta in February 45, it was decided that Poland would belong to the Soviet sphere of influence and that the Eastern Poland would uh, be incorporated in the Soviet Union. So as the uh, Germany surrendered uh, in May of 1945, the war in Europe came to an end. As the result of the World War II, Poland's Eastern territories became part of the Soviet empire. And uh, following the war, there was one of the biggest migrations of the mo modern history. About three and a half millions of Germans were expelled from former German territories. Um, at the same time, about one and a half million people from the east side, uh, east side of the Kurzon zone were expelled. Uh, uh, there was also about half a million of Ukrainians and Belarusians and Lithuanians who were driven out of Poland to the Soviet Union. The, there were the resettlements. Uh, these resettlements were often, often carried forcibly and in awful conditions. This is a picture of the, the Polish uh, resettlers. Uh, the picture was actually taken by a very famous um, photographer, John Vachon. He was actually a Minnesota native. Uh, he graduated from University of St. Thomas and he um, he's the only person that documented thoroughly uh, what was happening in Poland uh, with the, um, in, in, after following the, the war. With these deportations, nobody will know how many people died due during the deportation due to, due to shifting of Poland's borders. And Maria, one of the project participants, she was part of the part of the deportations, and she remembers traveling on the train for for weeks on end when they arrived to the western part of Poland. Uh, whatever they had left, had left, whatever food had left, and animals that they had left, it was taken away from them. They were uh, assigned a house that was still uh, occupied by a German family. The Germans were very kind to them. They gave them a one room. They had only two rooms in the entire house and they fed them for, for many months before the Germans were deported into the Germany, German part. So by June of 1945, United States and United Kingdom withdrew the recognition of the Polish government in exile and instead recognized the Soviet imposed uh, government in Poland. <clears throat> the soldiers, fa Polish soldiers faced the awful recognition that there was no independent Poland to return home and that life in the exile beaconed. And that's how we have all these uh, refugees and these immigrants from that era. People just had no, fa no, no family, no, nothing to return, um, many of them. Uh, their land was taken, their possessions were taken, or the family did not exist anymore. Um, as a show of uh, Soviet domination, uh, the prominent leaders of Polish anti-Nazi underground were brought to trial in Moscow. Uh, there were about, uh, by f in 45 to 47, about half a million of Polish soldiers were stationed in Poland. Uh, 
between 45 and 48, uh, hundreds, uh, hundreds of thousands of Poles were imprisoned by the Soviet authorities. Many of the uh, resistance and home army members were apprehended and executed. executed. Uh, people were still, uh, some of the people were still deported into the Soviet Union, particularly the people who lived in Upper Silesia. <clears throat> Uh, thousands of people died in the post-war struggle and the prosecution and tens of uh, thousands were sentenced by courts and fabricated and arbitrary charges and deported into Soviet unions. The mass arrests uh, continued into early 50s. Uh, the, you know, the post-war post division of Europe withdrew borders, leaving many people who had lived uh, in what was now Soviet Germany displaced inside a smaller Poland under Soviet occupation, which lasted from 1945 until uh, 1989. And Polish society is yet still to grapple with the enormous changes it underwent in the 20th century. And uh, I would like to thank the project participants. Uh, and I wish to thank all the people who supported and informed us otherwise and contributed to the project. I would like to thank Adam Hangurski, uh, Anatol Maciejny, Leonard Jankowski, Magdalena Świderski, Maria Stefans, Walter Remiasz, and Viktor Merrill, who are very patient uh, participant and generous with their time and snacks. And I would like to thank their relatives who helped uh, facilitate the interviews and the contacts uh, uh, and uh, helped uh, and assisted uh, the project, including Diana Remiasz, Elizabeth Seidner, Myrna Ornstein, and Steven Jankowski, and uh, Andrew Remiasz. And we had a, a pretty large team. The team consisted of our lead photographer, Grzegorz Litynski, a number of transcriptionists, translators, interpreters, and editors, including Amy Glazer, Mark Lita, Grzegorz Litynski, Patricia Stachowicz, Renata Stachowicz, Agnieszka Kemmerly. They all work tirelessly despite living in different time zones and make the process enjoyable experience. And thank you very much. Thank you, Kenazina. Um, we have one question in the chat. And um, if you have a question in the chat, please put it in there. But there's just a few of us. So I think if we're all OK with it, what I will do is um, while Katarzyna is answering this one question, um, I will let everybody unmute. But I would ask you if you have background noise or um, if someone is talking, please turn your microphone off and then you can turn it back on again to ask a question or make a comment. So the question in the chat is um, during World War II and afterward, ordinary Poles suffered terribly, which you discussed. Um, but in your mind, which occupation was considered worse, the, Germ the Nazi Germans or the Soviet Union? Or it sounds like they were both pretty awful. They were both awful and they were both awful in a different way. Um, you know, um, I, I, I would hate to make comparison. Um, to each they were they were they were they were just there they were similar in many ways and they were different in many ways i think that if people are interested in doing more reading there is an interesting uh, book written by annie applebaum uh, called gulag that gives a history of russian work camps um, german work camps were actually modeled by the russian uh inspired by the russian uh uh, gulags which uh, were uh, used in Soviet Union well before the Second World War started but the both occupations were were roof, ruthless and very cruel I actually spoke to somebody uh, who uh, is writing a book about uh, a Czech uh, German occupation and uh, when we were comparing notes and discussing stories and kind of looking into the history, he said it was much different in Czech Republic. And Czech Republic is not very far from Poland. So Poland was really singled out for horrible atrocities. Thank you for that. Um, does anybody else have a question that you'd like to ask? So while we're waiting for the questions, Katarzyna, do you want to talk a little bit about the future of the project? You mentioned that most of the people that you um, did the oral interviews with are elderly, 
And so, you know, capturing their stories if they haven't already passed um, before, before they leave us. Um, but what is the future of the project? So the future of the, so we have a couple of numbers of a uh, number of exhibits coming up. So we have this, uh, this current exhibit, the interrupted childhood um, is currently at the landmark. Uh, we are working on another ex this exhibit traveling to uh, University of St. Thomas in the fall. Um, we have had a, a previous exhibit uh, play, uh, placed there as well. And um, I'm pl very pleased to announce that um, Minneapolis Airport Foundation uh, is, um, is agreed to display uh, the kaleidoscope uh, at the Minneapolis airport. Uh, so this is a traveling exhibit. Um, we, tr we attempt to present Polish history through photography in a sense that it's supposed to pique people's interest, but people really need to read the stories and, and get interested in the reading about the history, you know, get a little bit more into details of the, of the, of the narratives. Uh, we are uh, considering writing a book um, about uh, these, these particular individuals talking, uh, talking about the, based on the narratives and uh, weaving uh, history of Poland into that into the book into the books um you know but i really would like to stress one thing that really came very uh, was very striking to me because i knew that these individuals um had very painful stories um and um what was very striking to me when each and every one of them when i met with them when they were very positive when i asked them about the hardest time in their life or if they had complaints about their life they said no my life was good well when i was living in in the soviet union in in germany in or in germany in you know working as a slave laborer or in a in a in a, in a work system in in soviet union that was awful but my life was good uh, they were so positive, um, grateful for every day, and um, I was actually I, it was striking to me that they how positive they really were. The other striking um, a comment I would like to make is many of these stories, many of these individuals, when I talked to them, they did not talk to anybody about them. Their families didn't know their stories actually, or they knew parts mm -hmm. of the stories, which was very interesting. You know, yeah. Anato, for instance, they came, uh, you know, I met with him and he, you know, he brought a lot of photos, family photos and whatever they could find, you know, their, their belongings were lost or burnt or stolen or, you know, uh, lost somewhere. Um, but uh, he's like, oh, he's like, I, have you talked to anybody about it? No, you're the first person to ask. Interesting. Yeah. Does anybody or, else have a question? Well, I, I have a maybe a, a more ambiguous question. Um, but one of the things that I'm curious about is like the history of European uh, anti Polishness. Um, uh, it's my understanding, and, and, and also. You know, I, I know how well how much of that maybe was uh, based in some kind of anti-Semitism because I know like I, I don't know how it's pronounced in Polish, but Lublin was uh, I, I, my understanding is that it had a very substantial Jewish population, and I know that a lot of uh, Jewish people I know have family who needed to escape, you know, Russia before it became the Soviet Union. And I know that the history of, in Germany of anti-Polish feelings is substantial that even exists here, or at least when I was growing up, existed here in a lot of uh, German American communities. So I, I don't know if there's anything- it's a, very, it's a very complicated, complicated question. Yeah. Um, so I would like to stress that Polish German relations during the First World War and following the First World War were quite different than they were during the Second World War. So people, uh, Polish people during the Second World War expected the same or similar treatment of by the Germans um, they experienced during the First World War. So there was a sudden shift in the German uh, 
uh, propaganda uh, in the 30s uh, and, and the way of treatment of Polish people, which, which I, I find really interesting. Um, you know, it's worth noting that Poland before the First World War was split in between tw three countries. It was split between uh, Prussia, uh, Russia and, uh, and uh, Austria or Austro-Hungarian uh, Empire. So it was split between two, three countries. So it became one country kind of stuck in the middle, uh, connected from three different parts of three different, uh, three different countries, three different systems and three different cultures. Um, it's hard to tell what caused the shift in the 30s uh, in, the, in Germany. There were a lot of the, I think that anti-Polishness was also related to uh, the propaganda that ensued during the war and after the war. Like uh, some people are watching, uh, you know, when I came to the States, people don't know much about Polish history, but they remember, uh, they may remember uh, photos of Polish, uh, Polish armed cavalry uh, attacking tanks. Um, which is a, 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 a German propaganda movie actually, but this has been incorporated into the a common narrative as Polish people were so stupid, they were fighting tanks with, with, the, um, with, the, with, with, uh, with horses, uh, with lances, which, you know, which is really not true, but you know, it's, it's, it. <laughs> so there was a, a strong anti-Polish narrative. I mean, with Soviet, with Soviet, uh, with Soviet Union, I, the deporta you know, deportations and sending people to Siberia is something that uh, the Soviets and the Russians did for centuries. It's not a new invention. Uh, I think the Soviets just uh, perfected it. Um, so um, it's, it's, it's hard to say. It's very, very complicated. I don't know if I answered your question. Oh, uh, well, yeah, thank you. I mean, your perspective is. You have a question. Uh, valuable. But indeed, uh, you know, when you think about the Jewish present and how many Jews lived in 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 Poland before the war, a majority of European Jews lived in Polish territories uh, or former Polish territories. Poland was quite a big country before it was split up um, between the three countries in. Uh, the, 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 the three empires and uh, because of the Jewish decrease in other parts of the Europe, um, Jews moved to Poland because Poland was more tolerant. So there was a large Jewish population uh, living in the, in the Polish territories, which were then split into the three countries. So that's how Poland uh, came to have a large number of Jewish populations uh, uh, d during the during the second, before the, the first war, uh, before the second, in between the wars. And you're right. Uh, there are cities that just disappeared, villages that just disappeared. People are not there. Thanks. It's, 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 I see a couple of other folks who have unmuted. I don't know if anyone has a question. Yeah. A, large, yeah. a large population. Janice, did you have a question? No, Anybody else have a question? Oh. No, my husband's Polish and we're just discussing something. Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. So during the war, it's uh, estimated that about 6 million of Polish, over 6 millions of Polish citizens died. And three of them, 3 million were Polish Jews. That's, uh, that's the official number. Oh, 6 million Polish. Good. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. You're welcome. Any last words, Katarzyna? We're getting close to time. And well, uh, I want to say thank you to you and to um, all the participants in this project. And um, please keep us informed as it goes forward. We'd love to make sure that, you know, we get the word out as it as it moves around or whatever we can do to help. Thank you very much. I appreciate your willingness to listen to this uh, to this difficult, difficult story. And for me, it's like you know, my last comment is like, why are Polish people stuck on Second World War? Well, they are stuck on the Second World War because they couldn't really talk about what happened in Poland until 1989. So a lot of the stories that I'm talking about 
um, they were not known in Poland by many people until 1989. And some of the Second World War stories actually history is, is, is still evolving. And many of these stories because of the Iron Curtain and uh, the history that we were allowed, I grew up behind Iron Curtain, the history that we were taught in school, uh, these narratives were not included. So, um, so this is this is another interesting uh, topic. It was not discussed. It was not in part of official official uh, official um, official uh, history that was taught. The academics knew it, uh, but the 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 population didn't. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Do you want to remind us about the exhibit again at Landmark? So the exhibit at Landmark is until uh, will is open until. Um, April 30th, that Sunday, April 30th, I will be taking it down. <laughs> so, so you have a chance of seeing the exhibit. Um, and uh, I think on a on Friday, April 21st, I will be given a tour. Uh, if anybody would like to join us, I will put it on the website. There's a group of people who are interested in a private tour. So uh, in the afternoon, the building closes at 5 p.m. So the tour needs to happen between, you know, will happen probably around 3 or 4 p.m. Um, so I will I will put information on the website and please uh, join us if you're interested. And could you uh, mention that website again, Katarzyna, just so people know where to go? So our website, if you Google Minnesota Polish Medical Society, it should come up. And it's uh, in it's um, this that that our domain name is quite um, quite unwieldy because it's uh, we changed the name of the organization in twenty one so we just uh, had to keep the old domain uh, but uh, it's Minnesota Polish Medical Society Polish Medical Society mm -hmm. Minnesota, Minnesota Polish, Polish Medical Polish Society. Medical Society. Okay. We used to be Polish American Medical Society of Minnesota, and as we were, you know, filling forms and doing various uh, things, it just the name wouldn't fit into some um, some forms. So we had, we simplified the name. <laughs> Great. Great. Okay. Um, and the exhibit is open, as Katarzyna mentioned, through um, the last day will be April thirtieth, and you can check the Landmark Center website. Um, for their hours and there are evening hours usually on thursday evenings i believe they're still open late um otherwise they are open on weekends so mm -hmm. um yeah thank you everybody for being here and thank you dr lee tack for this wonderful moving very important presentation um it certainly wasn't covered in any history classes i took um <laughs> and it's it's wonderful that you're making this available and getting these stories from the elders and um please come back for another history revealed soon and again i want to thank the east side freedom library and the roseville library and all of you for coming thank you very much for having me thank you thank you thank you good night everyone good night, good night. everybody stay safe enjoy the warmer weather <laughs> when it comes when it comes <laughs> <laughs> thank you yeah. Thank you. And thank you, Mary, for mentioning that you saw the exhibit. Yeah. Yeah, we'll oh, be and before I go, I do want to mention the part one is up on the Ramsey County Historical Society YouTube channel. And this will also be this recording will also be up on the Ramsey County Historical Society YouTube channel sometime next week. I think I did a better job today than I did last time. Oh, you did a great job. <laughs> so, yeah. Thank you thank all. You. Good night. Yeah, this is, this is really great because, you know, I, I tell my students, uh, you have to examine history in the way that we're usually shown it or fed it mm -hmm. leaves out a lot. Um, yeah. mm -hmm. You know, uh, just, you know, I, I mean, it's amazing. We in the United States.